Today we're doing a exercise uh, across the, the state here in Louisiana uh, so that we can better perfect all of our uh, assets and how we're going to respond to different types of uh, disasters. You'll see different things that are happening uh, in three different locations. All the state agencies, in particular the Army National Guard, uh, state, all the state agencies, because each one of those has a critical component or role that they play in any type of a disaster. Certainly also our local partners are the key because they're on the front line and they need to know and our citizens need to know that we're here to support them and back them up and uh, do everything we can to protect our residents. This morning in Lane 7 what we're going to be demonstrating is personnel search and recovery using aviation assets for evacuees that possibly cannot be evacuated by ground assets. You'll be having two Black Hawk helicopters that will be coming in to land simulating the landing area for a lily pad a lily pad is nothing more than possibly a place where we can triage patients for the severity of their injuries or whatnot and also further evacuate them via ground assets to a higher level of care if needed. So that's what's going to be happening. When there's a situation where we cannot land an aircraft to evacuate evacuees, what we can do is utilize hoist assets that we have, which that's going to be a demonstration in this location over here where we can actually, if there's debris, fire, they're in water, we can actually extract those individuals one at a time. Evacuated over 10,000 people during Katrina this way. I would say 90 to 99 percent of the evacuees will occur via this method, landing in a hasty landing zone, putting those individuals on, and then repositioning them to the lily pads that are designated, which we have designated all across southern Louisiana. The next demonstration you're going to be seeing is a hoist operation. They're going to be doing it at 25 foot for safety reasons, but we're able to go up to at least 250 foot above the objective if needed. Utilizing the hoist is usually used when the aircraft cannot land due to debris or obstacles that prevent it from uh, landing in the ACLZ or where you have an injured personnel. The aircraft that is uh, in picture, the, the capabilities of this aircraft, it's um, can carry up to with seats installed up to 10 evacuees. If we pulled out seats for example for Katrina we got up to 30 evacuees in each aircraft. That does increase the risk and it depends on the emergency for either seats in operations or seats out. As far as hoist operations, typically what would happen is the hoist will be lowered, you'll pick up one evacuee place them in. If it's a medevac configured aircraft, it will be I have the capability for four litters. And as you can see, this is a long, tedious process, so the majority of evacuations will occur where they actually land in the ground and you could get 10 to 20 personnel out in a very quick manner. When the governor declares a, a state of emergency, the Guard and, and uh, the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries become partners we team up together and we and we conduct search and rescue when uh, when the mission uh, calls for that. We generally handle the waterborne side of it and the guard supports us. They need to come out and assist with search and rescue but a lot of times they help us with uh, transport and uh, setting up a, a, a collection point and helping uh, funnel all of the evacuees through the process to get everybody to the correct locations. What we're doing today, uh, we have three scenarios that are going on. One of them actually just came in. It was uh, an injured person that was on a spine board. Um, and right now we're, uh, we're in the process of, of bringing some more people in that were just a, a simulation for being stranded out of the camp. Um, put some wildlife and fisheries or enforcement agents in their boats. It uh, serves as a force multiplier and it enhances communications between the two agencies. So we feel that it really, um, it's a good system and it, and it works and, and we're pretty happy with the way things are going today. In a moment we're going to launch a, um, another rescue from here. Uh, a boat, uh, a, a guard's boat and one of our boats are going to go out and, uh, and pick up some, some injured people. 
Also in these scenarios, we'll use a local sheriff's office, and today we're using the St. Charles Parish Sheriff's Office. They can also help with search and rescue, but they do assist us with security, especially if we're having problems or reports of, of looting. Uh, and they've, they've proven invaluable in, 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 in those types of scenarios, and they're here with us today as well. In this scenario, the, the, uh, the rescuers are after an elderly blind man. He has a CNI dog. He's not hurt but he just needs to be rescued. And the, the, way, uh, the way we designed this, this, uh, this actual rescue, we, um, we received the report, we got with the, uh, the leaders for the, the National Guard and we discussed the plan, uh, and then we, uh, we assigned this, this task out to the agents who will actually be conducting the rescue in the field. And that's what you're seeing now. Those two boats that are actually heading towards the launch they were on a mission. Uh, they had a couple of people stranded in a the house. They're fine. They're, uh, they should be coming back to the launch in just a moment. We'll actually bring them to a collection point like you see over here to your, uh, to your left. For a waterborne search and rescue, we have approximately 225 agents, um, and we have a, at least 200 boats that we can, we can employ. We have different styles of boats, so it'll be situation dependent. Uh, we do have a, a a lot of shallow draft boats, which is mostly what we'll be, we would be using in a scenario like this, the, the flat boats that you see here, uh, and then we have various other smaller boats with different styles of engines that would allow us to access shallow water um, as, as needed. This is um, a couple of people that were rescued from, from a stranded building. They're being dropped off at a collection point. And this is our last rescue of the day, this boat coming in with the blue lights. This is the gentleman who's, who's blind and he has a CNI dog. He's going to be dropped off at this collection point. Well, the value in, a, in an exercise like this is it allows us to work with all the agencies involved. It gives the, 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 role, the role players or the agents involved a, fami a familiarity, familiarity with one another. And it, it allows us a working relationship before an event actually starts. So it gives us a... Uh, a good idea of how we will respond in an actual event. It also helps us identify problems with communication, problems with equipment, things that worked, things that didn't work, and areas of improvement. So when we do have an event uh, where we were called upon to act on behalf of the state, the idea is to have all of the bugs worked out of the system and to make sure that everything happens safely and effectively. My name is Second Lieutenant uh, Tavalis Lawton from the 2225th multi Road Bridge Company. I'll be briefing you on Lane 9, which is the Improved Riven Bridge uh, rafting capabilities. As you can see to my rear, that is our five-bay float raft currently up, uh, currently ferrying over a Humvee. The components of this raft is three interior bays and two ramps on each end, which elevate up to a level of six feet, which enables us to offload on high banks or low banks. Additionally, and you can't quite see them right now, but there are bridge erection boats actually pushing the ferry over to the near bank. Those bridge erection boats are used, <clears throat> they're capable of, they have two 250 horsepower engines, also with a jet drive, which means that they can operate in shallow waters. They have a draft of up to 22, 22 inches, which means that we can, we can operate in very shallow water. The raft itself, in, under its current construction has a draft of only 12 inches and that's empty. This, this raft right here, the construction of this raft was actually deployed during Deepwater Horizon where we used, we used it to assist with the uh, oil spill cleanup. We ferried personnel and equipment out to the Grand Terra Islands as well as recovered the hazardous material and returned it to a central collection point. Okay, this bridge it can be in, utilized in an emergency by ferrying operation just as you see it now. It can, it can carry up to 180 pounds of equipment or personnel. Just for example, in Deepwater Horizon, we used to carry cranes out to the Grand Terre Islands. We carried cranes, we carried 18 wheelers which were used to uh, suck up the oil off the top of the water in the Gulf of Mexico. So that's, a, that's an actual real life deployment that this unit actually participated in. As you see my bridge commander now, he's guiding the raft onto the near shore. 
which he's, he's controlling both of the, the bridge erection bolts simultaneously via arm and hand signals. He's located on top of the Humvee up there. Okay, what's going on now? Once he levels off the raft, they will unload the Humvee or whatever piece of equipment that's that's a cup that, that's being transported. Put it back here. It looks like a lot of work. It takes a lot of control from the bridge commander as well as Hello? the bridge erection boat drivers. We spent countless of hours practicing on the bridge erection boats in order to be able to do this. At this time, I'd like to focus your attention to my immediate left, which we have an interior bay mounted on a common boat transporter, which is the truck that we use to, to transport the bridge bays, interior bays and ramps. That particular bay is how we extend the ferry into a bridge. We're capable of, of spanning gaps and bridging gaps up to 633 feet with the same, the same equipment that we're using right now by adding additional interior bays. At this time, I'm gonna provide a demonstration of how this bay is actually launched and controlled via the bridge erection boat. We're looking at the common boat transporter with the, the interior bay mounted. You see this beep, the bridge erection boat here, circling around in pace. This is our catch boat. What's going to happen is that bay will be released into the water and it will automatically unfold. This, sa this catch boat will, will maneuver up to the bay and secure that bay and maneuver it as the bridge commander needs it. The technique that we're using to launch this bay is called a free launch. We have to free launch when the water level is low. At this time, the water level is up right around three, uh, four or five feet, but we need three feet to actually deploy this interior bay. This interior bay is, is used to expand what we were previously talking about, the ferry. So if we have a piece of equipment that's larger, that requires more more room than a five-fold flare, we can expand the ferry to six, six bays, or seven bays, or eight bays, whatever the requirement is. And as we, as the bays are, are as the, the ferry is extended, the more weight capacity we can hold. The current construction of the, the ferry that we're using today can carry up to 180,000 pounds, which is the, the size of an M1A1 tank, the Army's largest asset with its equipment and trailers. Okay, you're seeing, the, you're seeing the bridge crew member secure that bay to the bridge erection boat. Once he secures the, secures the bridge erection boat to the bay, the boat driver will await the bridge commander's guidance on, on where he wants that bridge bay to be placed. The most recent use for, for this particular construction was Deepwater Horizon. That was our last deployment down in, in Grand, uh, Grand Terre Islands. As I mentioned, we used it to ferry uh, personnel and equipment out to the Grand Terre, Grand Terre Islands where they were, they were actually conducting the oil spill cleanup off of the beaches. Sling operations utilizing the UH-60 Blackhawk. Uh, you'll be seeing that it, coming in from the north area right over here. We have one UH-60 that's going to be sling loading approximately eight th an 8,000 pound sandbag. These operations were conducted for Katrina, Deepwater Horizon, and what they do is for reinforcing levee systems, levee breaches, or blocking actual access like we did for Deepwater Horizon for oil spill operations. In conjunction with the, the Black Hawk helicopter and the 244th, the 769th Engineer Battalion, they fill the sandbags, they rig the sandbags, and they coordinate the pickups for these bags.
once the engineers are located close to where the breach has occurred, the turnaround with four to five aircraft, uh, we can drop hundreds of thousands of pounds of sand in any location that's required. Each aircraft has a loiter time of approximately two hours on station. We came in to actually come in and do a build a sandbag berm with a sandbag reinforcement. With on top of that, we actually have a little bit of flood protection and actually have a, a couple of the items that we use for flood protection as a demonstration and then actually ex explain to the guys how we do our sandbagging for both. Sandbagging is utilized during flood fight events for extra protection that we have. Uh, last year is a good example. We did have an area where we put out about 120,000 sandbags on a, on a seepage berm. So they're utilized for almost every event that where we have little small issues that we take care of. The sandbags are approximately 40 pounds. We have a, they're, they vary a little bit in size, so that can be a, a little bit different. Our large sandbags are about 3,000 pounds. And then, um, of course, we do have our HESCO baskets too that take about uh, take a little bit of dirt in each one. The sandbags are effective because they're actually, they're, they're, it's a very mobile unit. They, they are flexible. They can go into a lot of places. We actually can, we can put them out almost anywhere. So it's actually a great unit for us to have, and we have you know, multiple capacities of being able to fill them up. The lily pad operations is really the first point that the casualties are going to start their processing. There's three steps to the lily pad process. We intake the individuals that have just been rescued that you watched from out there. We identify who they are and we identify any special needs they might have so that we can get them to the right stations in the parish collection point which is just beyond us. So we take the individuals in. We try to get their information, see if they have any identification on them right away, and ascertain any special needs, whether they're injured, whether they are an unaccompanied minor. Um, we also take in individuals, uh, try to check them for weapons. If they have a weapon on them, we'll take them over to the clearing barrel, clear the weapon, secure it, and we will hand walk that weapon back to the next staging area where the parish collection point has deputies that we'll turn them over to just to make sure everything's safe through the process. What's the uh, value in preparedness? Certainly it's uh, all the coordination and communications between local, state, and federal partners. As you see here this morning, we have all the partners from state and local uh, doing communications and then doing those search and rescue, doing each one of the exercises so that we can perfect them and be ready. Today is our disaster rehearsal exercise, what we refer to it as, and it, it's our opportunity to test our plans. Uh, with all the emergency support functions throughout the state, the state agencies, our federal partners, our local partners. It's really a way to test the plans that we've written that we think we will have to execute if and when an emergency comes. But it helps us validate them and if we see weaknesses in them, it allows us to go back and correct those weaknesses before the actual disaster happens. We're doing very similar uh, type uh, exercises in Hackberry. We're also doing food distribution down in St. Bernard. So it's a combination of things as we're putting it all together. We have search and rescue here, not only for uh, folks, but we also have wildlife, uh, livestock, and, and the like here that we're doing at this location, and levee repair. So we've tried to bring it all together with state and federal and local partners uh, to do this exercise. I think we're, we're extremely prepared. You know, in Gustav and Ike, we did a great job. All the agencies at the local, state, federal level uh, did a great job in executing the missions, if you will, that they had to, to perform to take care of our citizens and secure their property. And so, but from that, we came out and, and did additional planning. Uh, we've refined it through the oil spill, through the flood, through the floods of last year, the Mississippi River flood. And so we, we have a great plan uh, that's, that is executable. Uh, and, and we have resources that are still available to us if we need more capability. If the disaster becomes more catastrophic, we have reach back capability where we can bring in extra capabilities to help us out. What would you like the average person in Louisiana to know and be prepared for? Certainly to bring to the forefront the, the big, largest disaster that we see is uh, hurricane season. It's right around the corner. So I would request that they get a game plan, be prepared, certainly the time of the year. Uh, as we're doing our exercises, bring to the forefront to the public uh, to be prepared, to have that medication ready, to know where they're going to go in case evacuations are called on a local level, uh, and to be prepared. What's your reaction to everything that you've seen here today? Oh, tremendous. Uh, it, it's a great, we call this an interagency process where you get all the various agencies coming together uh, to work in coordination with each other. So 
that that spirit has been unbelievable. Uh, we've had unbelievable participation, and I think today is going to be just a, a wonderful exercise for us. Oh, uh, fabulous! All the team has come together. Now, what we'll do after this is we'll critique it to see whether we have any weaknesses and how we can do it a better job. So, all the partners are, are doing a great job. If people have questions or like more information about getting a game plan, what should they do? They can go to uh, getagameplan.org.